Hello everybody. Thank you for joining us for the third of our quantum materials seminars. It's great to see so many people here. Um, my name is Helena and I'm the quantum materials outreach officer here in the Department of Physics. Now let me introduce our speaker this week, Miska Elliott. Uh, Miska is a second year DEFL student here in the quantum materials group. Um, like I said last week, if you're at last week's seminar, DEFL is basically what Oxford calls a PhD. Um, and she is going to tell you a little bit about her work using neutron scattering experiments to help us understand a bit more about what's going on inside quantum materials. So from muons last week to neutrons this week. So it's another useful experimental technique that you'll be hearing about today. So without further ado, I will hand over to Miska. So thank you. Okay. Um, hi everyone. I'm Miska Elliott. I'm from the quantum materials group in Oxford. Um, it's really nice to see so many people here. Um, so I am currently, as Helena said, I'm currently studying for a DPhil in condensed matter physics. So my studies are specialized into using neutron scattering as an experimental technique to explore the strange and wonderful world of quantum magnetism. So during this talk, I'll focus on neutron scattering as an experimental technique. So specifically, I'll focus on why we might want to actually do neutron scattering and what it can reveal about crystalline magnetic systems and how contemporary neutron scattering is performed um, as an important part of 21st century physics. I also want to explain how magnetism is a quantum phenomenon. And hopefully here, I'll be able to outline um, how it's a consequence of the microscopic laws of quantum mechanics and how this can be manifested on larger scales in a material and how these simple rules, uh, just a handful of simple rules can give rise to some really strange and exotic structures. Uh, and then I'd like to finish off, uh, if there's time, with a real world example how neutron scattering can be used to determine the magnetic structure in a crystalline quantum magnet. So my research focuses on neutron scattering from crystalline materials. So here's a little diagram of a, um, of a material that I'm currently working on. It's called cobalt titanate. So even though crystals are typically electrically neutral, um, the crystal is constituted, the, the crystal is constructed from ions and ions have electric charge and they're bond, strongly bonded together through electrostatic forces of attraction and repulsion. If we were to use charged particles to probe the internal structure of such crystals, these trajectories would get deflected um, quite strongly by the constituent ions of the crystal. Neutrons, however, are electrically neutral. And this means, uh, and they don't experience these electrostatic forces. Neutrons, however, experience the nuclear strong force. And so it can be scattered from each atomic site in the crystal by the central nuclei. So this will allow the structural properties of the crystal to be probed. Um, so for those who ask, um, so for, for those who answered the poll that they don't know much about neutrons, what you need to know is that a neutron is an electrically neutral particle that's usually tucked away deep inside the atomic nuclei. Um, so furthermore, the neutron is a quantum particle, and so it will have a wave-like nature to which we can assign a wavelength. So um, I've just drawn a little cartoon of a wave. And the important part of this is that the wavelength of neutrons from a nuclear reactor are comparable to the atomic separations of the ions in the crystal. And so this is a really important criterion to probe the structure of a crystal through diffraction. The wave particle duality of quantum particles, specifically in this case neutrons, is of vital importance here. Although it might sound like a preposterous idea that we should reject, both the wave and particle-like properties of neutrons are exploited and are fundamental to neutron scattering techniques. Um, in addition, neutrons carry energy. Um, you know, we shoot neutrons, they will have energy because they're moving. And in a scattering process, they may deposit some of this energy into the crystal. This is called inelastic scattering. To illustrate this idea, some ions in the crystal may possess a property called spin. I'll talk about that later, but at the moment, I'm just going to denote that by arrows on some of the ions. The incoming neutron can cause a spin to deviate from its ground state orientation. And this disturbance will ripple through the crystal in what's called a spin wave. 
And I've drawn a really silly cartoon here to, to demonstrate that. Anyway, finally, a neutron, although electrically neutral, carries magnetic moment. That is to say, on a very, very small scale, the, the neutron will look a little bit like a bar magnet. This property allows the neutron to magnetically scatter from the crystal. And this allows us to prove the magnetic in addition to the structural properties of the crystal. So let's focus a little bit on elastic scattering. So if I were to have a crystal structure consisting of two atomic, plate, two atomic layers um, separated by some distance d, so I'm going to draw that on my diagram here. And then if we have two waves, the same wavelength impinging upon the crystal, then they can elastically scatter at the same angle from these layers. Um, and here, elastic scattering means that they can change momentum, but they don't deposit any energy into the crystal. The lower ray will have a little extra bit of distance to travel. And if you want to do some geometry, you can show that this distance is 2d sine theta. And in general, these waves, because they've traveled a bit of, because they've traveled a different distance, um, in general, these waves will be out of phase and will interfere. However, constructive interference will occur if this distance is a multiple of the wavelength of the waves. So if we average this out, um, across the entire crystal, we will only see elastic scattering at angles that correspond to these D spacings corresponding to separation of atomic planes. So this can all be written down in a single equation. And this is called Bragg's Law. And it'd be, it's very useful in um, elastic scattering, whether you're doing x-rays or whether you do neutrons. And it's so important that we will come back to this a little bit later. So as I said earlier, neutrons are really tucked away inside the atomic nuclei. So how do we scatter, the, how do we get them out of there in order to scatter them from crystals? Well, one way to do this is um, using a particle accelerator. So the first step is we have to accelerate protons, which is actually very doable because protons are simply the nuclei of hydrogen and they're electrically charged. So we can just accelerate them across the voltage and make them go very fast. So this is a schematic diagram of the ISIS neutron and muon facility um, based in Harwell, which is near Oxford. So first, a beam of hydrogen minus ions is accelerated in a straight line to about 37% 37, oh, 37 the speed of light. This beam of particles is then injected into a ring and accelerated to about 99% the speed of light. Okay, so that's what that range stands for. Then these highly energetic beams are shot in bunches into a spallation target. This process is repeated about 50 times per second. So four out of five of the bunches go to this, this area here, target station one. And the one out of five of the bunches will go to this, this area here, target station two. A spallation target is a fancy name or a house brick sized block of tungsten. The highly energetic protons will, will, are so energetic and move so quickly that they're able to overcome the electrostatic forces of repulsion from the tungsten nuclei and will collide with them. This will make the nuclei unstable and these unstable tungsten nuclei will then undergo nuclear fission. They will break apart and re release between 15 and 20 neutrons in the process. These neutrons are then funneled into beam lines for a highly specialized instrument. So what I mean by a beam line is that around each target station, it looks like a little, little onion. And then around the central core, there are, beam, there are just pipes. And the neutrons travel through these pipes through an instrument here. So this is a very grand scale picture of a big science facility. But what about individual experiments that get performed there? Well, in my case, in my case, you have to mount a crystal sample. So here's a picture of iron titanate, which is the material that I'm studying for my DFIL. It's mounted on an aluminium base and it's wrapped in protective aluminium foil. Um, interestingly, I, I bought this foil from Tesco. There's really nothing special about the foil. <laughs> the markings on the base of the mount denote special crystallographic directions that I determined in um, determined in the lab here at Oxford before I traveled to ISIS. 
I then went to ISIS in order to use the NET instrument, which is here. Um, NET stands for Low Energy Transfer, and it's appropriate for my research because I wanted to explore the low energy magnetic excitations in this particular crystal. The sample is then placed on the end of a very long stick, and it's then placed into the instrument here, denoted by this red bar. Note that um, in this picture, there is a human in the instrument, and this is to give a sense of scale. Um, typically, humans don't need to enter the instrument, and the reason is um, neutron radiation is really harmful to life. So there's a really um, complicated system of interlocks in place that prevent this, um, the instrument being used while it's being accessed. So making sure there aren't any people inside the instrument, a neutron beam is then incident upon the sample from the spallation target. And these neutrons may scatter from the material and denoted by this outgoing arrow here. It would then be, this, these neutrons can then be incident upon this curved bank of tubes on the back wall of the instrument. Um, and then from here, um, we can measure the energy deposited into the crystal and the three components of momentum transferred into the crystal. And we do this in a, in a process called time of flight scattering. So to go from, now we go from experimental techniques to talk about the theoretical ideas behind quantum magnetism. Here we introduce Paul Dirac, who is widely regarded as one of the greatest 20th century physicists. He discovered a lot of fundamental concepts in quantum mechanics, which are widely used to this day. But he was often too modest to name them after himself, and they're usually named after the second person to, to figure them out. One of his milestone achievements was to create a theory that described electrons that was consistent with both special relativity and quantum mechanics. This theory had huge consequences. It allowed him to model the hydrogen atom to unrivaled accuracy. It allowed him to theoretically predict antimatter. And it also allowed him to explain um, that electrons carry a quantum mechanical property called the spin. Um, also, the discovery also won him the Nobel Prize. So he's a very clever guy. Anyway, so Dirac discovered that electrons have a property called spin. The framework of this theory also Okay. Um, the framework of this theory also explains that electrons, because they have spin, also carry a magnetic dipole moment. So as I mentioned earlier, this just means that they act on a very small scale like a little bar magnet. He then went one step further, and he showed that if electrons interact with each other, then these spins can align. And if they do so in a material, then the material may exhibit a net magnetic dipole moment. Let's illustrate this idea with a diagram. So if we take an atomic chain, the electrons in each atom may contribute to a total atomic spin. Um, we, can do, we can illustrate this spin by an arrow, okay? So if the spins don't interact, then they will just do their own thing and they'll point in random directions. If each spin behaves like a small bar magnet, then we can point a north and a south pole. Um, so here we're going to label the head of the arrow north and the bottom of the arrow south. If the spins are pointed randomly, then the total magnetic moment will average out to zero. <clears throat> However, Dirac showed that the spins can interact with each other, and this will lead to them pointing in the same direction. <clears throat> so in this state, the magnetic moment will add up to give a sizable contribution. And this is exactly what happens in permanent magnetic materials. Excuse me. <clears throat> so this is exactly what happens in permanent magnetic materials, like a bar magnet or a fridge magnet. So we need quantum mechanics, courtesy of Dirac, to explain why these materials are permanently magnetic, which makes them everyday examples of quantum materials. Moreover, if you've ever wondered why magnets are so strange, this is why. Um, yes, so if you've ever wondered why they're so strange, this is why. They are manifestations of the weird laws of quantum physics, but of a size and scale that we can see and touch. So let's explore this idea a little further. Dirac showed that if neighboring sites interact, then there will be an associated energy proportional to the angle between them, 
and the spins will then move in order to minimize this interaction energy. Here, S is the size of the spin. And for quantum mechanical reasons, it comes in multiples of one half. J is something known as the exchange constant, and it will vary across materials. If the exchange constant is positive, then the lowest energy state, um, uh, well, the interaction energy will be minimized if this angle phi is zero, all the spins will be aligned and will be ferromagnetic. If the exchange constant is negative, then the interaction energy is minimized. If, the phi, if this angle phi is 180 degrees, then the spins will alternatively point up and down. We can be a little bit more adventurous and add even more interactions. So if we, get, if we have nearest neighbors J1 and next nearest neighbors J2, then we can have all sorts of things like spirals, um, and we can even plot a phase diagram. Um, I could go into more detail about this, uh, but I think it would take up too much time. So if we apply, if we apply this to a real world experiment, um, so for example, if we have a crystal containing gold and manganese ions, then um, we, and we have a picture here, the unit cell consists of a square base with a long axis. Um, the gold ions are gold, the purple ions are manganese, and the crystal consists of this repeating unit. Um, this is quite simple to deal with because all the sides are right angles and the manganese ions are at the corners with one in the center. This is known as a body-centered unit cell. So if we recall Bragg's law, we expect elastic scattering to occur at, angle, sorry, at angles theta that correspond to despacings between the planes of manganese ions according to this equation. So we can use Pythagoras theorem in 3D to calculate this despacing. Um, for crystallography, a lot of these things can be looked up in a big textbook or the International Crystallographic Tables. This is what I did here. Because the unit cell is body-centered, we will have constructive interference only if the indices H, K, and L add up to an even integer. This is known as the selection rule. So the takeaway point here is that if we plot scattering intensity against the scattering angle, we will have peaks which we can index with these indices, H, K, and L. So this experiment was performed in 1959 by Herpen, so this experiment was performed in 1959 by Herpen, Muriel, and Villain. They performed neutron scattering on a crystalline sample of um, manganese and gold, and the peaks corresponded to an elastic scattering from the manganese ions, where the neutrons have a wavelength of 1.13 angstroms. So note that here an angstrom is a unit of length corresponding to 10 to the minus 10 meters, or a tenth of a nanometer. Uh, for a sense of scale, typically hydrogen has a radius of one angstrom, and other atoms have a radii of around three angstroms. So we can plug in these values of H, K, and L to the formula for the D spacings on the previous slide. Since we know the wavelength, we can calculate the scattering angle. So here, the, peak, the peaks labeled with indices satisfy Bragg's law and are therefore indicative of the structural ordering in the crystal. However, this doesn't completely explain the spectrum here. We have anomalous peaks, which are labeled by a red star. And in order to understand what's going on, we have to be able to explain them. So to elucidate this further, we note that at high temperatures, crystals will have no magnetic order because the energy scale of random thermal fluctuations will exceed the energy scale of the exchange interaction. Structure order, however, is based on the positions of the atoms in the crystal. And um, as long as the crystal doesn't melt, this will persist at high temperatures. Therefore, we can subtract the high temperature spectrum from the low temperature spectrum and reveal peaks that are due to magnetic ordering. This is called a different spectrum. Here, the peaks with a red star correspond to the peaks with a red star on the previous slide, and we can completely attribute them to magnetic order. Additionally, helical ordering with a pitch angle, um, which is the spin angle on the, on the side of magnetism, will give satellite peaks with indices H, K, and L where the L will vary a little bit due to this pitch angle. So by using Bragg's law, the scattering angles of these satellite peaks reveal what the pitch angle is. And in this case, um, it's determined to be 51 degrees. And we can read this straight from um, this, uh, this elastic scattering data. So we can make a plot of the structure here. 
The arrows denote the direction of the spin, and this rotates in the AB plane but by 51 degrees for every step we go up. From here, we can conclude that elastic neutron scattering can be used to solve magnetic structures of crystalline materials. Um, we can also conclude that neutron scattering relies on the wave, wave sorry, the quantum wave particle like nature of neutrons. The wave like properties consist of peaks that obey Bragg's law, so the neutrons must have a wavelength. However, in spallation, we see that neutrons only appear in discrete quantities, which is very much a particle like property. Both the wave and particle like natures of the neutrons are exploited here. So the wave particle duality is not an idea that we can dismiss. I've also managed to show, hopefully, that magnetic materials are everyday examples of quantum materials. That is, they have properties that can be only explained using quantum mechanics. And exotic structures, such as exotic magnetic structures, such as those that have spiral order, offer an experimental testing ground of really strange theoretical ideas in quantum physics. Um, thank you. I'd like to take questions now, um, if people have time. Brilliant. Yeah, we've got time for questions. So thank you so much, Miske, uh, for that whistle stop tour through your research with neutron scattering. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it was really interesting to deep dive into some of the some of the actual quantum physics there and look at some of the equations that you're you're dealing with in your research. Thank you. Right. So we've had some really good questions. Mm -hmm. Quite a few about spin. <laughs> oh, great. Um, so the first one that's got the most upvotes at the moment. Um, an anonymous question asking, how do you determine an electron spin? That's a fantastic question. Um, so actually, the um, electron spin was first determined experimentally um, before Dirac explained it by um, two people called Stern and Gerlach. And one of them went on to win the Nobel Prize and the other didn't for political reasons that I'm not going to go into. Anyway, what they found was if you, um, so if you have an electron spin, uh, then the, yeah, there will, and you apply a magnetic field, there will be an energy associated to whether the spin is aligned or anti-aligned to the magnetic field. Um, so what they did was they passed an elect, they passed a beam of silver atoms that had spin, uh, had a single electron spin. In the um, in the silver ions, they pass it through magnetic an inhomogeneous magnetic field, and this led to a splitting uh, between the spin ups and the spin downs, and they collected it on a glass plate, um, and they used to smoke they used to be heavy smokers of cigars, so they blew cigar smoke and the cigar smoke contained sulfur onto these plates, and um, they, they took photos of these plates and sent them to Niels Bohr, who was the, the leading atomic theorist at the time, and said, look what we've discovered. Um, I, yeah, I hope that, that's sorry, it's a roundabout answer, but I hope that that answers your question. That's really fascinating to hear the history <laughs> behind yeah. the experiments there, behind the The history of quantum mechanics is crazy. Um, it's just a, a bunch of people in the 20s doing, doing crazy physics. Absolutely. Which leads on to another very popular question. Um, any good book suggestions to learn more about this or anywhere that people might want to check out if they want to know more? Yeah, so I remember when I was at school, I read, um, there were two books. Actually, I think three books now. He probably published another one by Leonard Susskind. Um, um, he has a course called The Theoretical Minimum. There's one about classical mechanics, which um, is very mathematically beautiful. There's one about quantum mechanics, which is a little bit harder. And there's one about special relativity. It's quite nice to read about, especially if you think you know what time is. <laughs> I mean, at this point, does anyone really have a concept of time? No. <laughs> Brilliant. And um, yeah, thinking about books, I think I would recommend, if you're interested in crystallography or magnetism, the Oxford Very Short Introductions are a very good place to start. Mm -hmm. um, as well. Um, yeah. Brilliant. So another physics -y question now. Uh, what is used to accelerate the particles to near light speeds? Ah, very good question. Um, so yeah, that's a very good question. So um, if, okay, so we have, um, here if we look at the top, so the first 
the first stage is that we accelerate hydrogen minus ions. Um, so all that is, it's, um, it's a hydrogen atom with an extra electron. Um, so it will have an overall electric charge. And what you do is you get um, a voltage gap between two plates. And um, from one, you inject the hydrogen minus ion and it will accelerate across this voltage gap. Um, so here you can see at the top, it says 70 big M, little e, big V. So what this means is it means 70 mega electron volts. An electron volt is a unit of energy and it's the unit, <clears throat> it's, it's the, en the kinetic energy that an electron has when it's been accelerated across one volt. Um, so 70 mega electron volts is the energy that an electron would have if you accelerate it um, across a gap of 70 megavolts. Um, and similarly, there's a, there's a ring, um, there's a ring called a synchrotron here, and it accelerates them much farther to 800 mega electron volts. Um, and that consists of multiple components. Uh, one of them is a bending magnet. So you need a magnet to make a charged particle go in a circle. Um, you also need a set of quadrupole magnets to focus your beam. Um, and then the third bit of equipment you need is a radio frequency cavity. And it means every time your, um, your beam or your pulse enters, enters this cavity, it gets a kick from a radio frequency field um, that's specifically tuned to impart energy into it. Um, so yeah, I, I hope that answers your question about accelerators. I'm not an accelerator physicist. I've just stepped a little bit from here and there. Yeah, that's fantastic. That was very thorough. Mm -hmm. answer. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so there's a question. Um, it says, why does the neutron have spin? It gives it this property. Um, so, okay. In order to answer this question, we have to think about, well, what is a neutron? Um, well, a neutron is, well, electrons are fundamental particles. Okay, so, you know, we can construct this model of what fundamental particles are, and we could say that fine, fundamental particles can carry charge uh, in discrete quantities, and they can carry um, spin, and it's just fine. That's just the property that fundamental particles have. Um, but if you look at uh, if you look at what a proton is, I will get to neutrons. Don't worry. But if you look at what a proton is, a proton consists of quarks. And quarks, like electrons, uh, as far as we know, are fundamental particles. They carry charge and they also carry spin. Um, so a neutron, so a proton and neutrons are just bundles of quarks, typically three, quark, well, three quarks. Um, and in combinations that give the proton plus one charge, and in combinations that give the neutron zero charge. Um, and because the quarks carry spin, um, it's possible for the, the band state of three quarks to also carry spin. Uh, and it happen, just so happens that the, the two lowest energy configurations of three quarks is a proton and a neutron, and they have a spin half. So, yeah, I'm afraid the answer is that's just how they bind together. Um, well, so neutron has spin because the quarks that make it up have spin and the way that's put together have an overall spin. Mm -hmm. Nice, yeah. nice, brilliant. Um, okay, any other questions jumping out to you or shall I pick one? Go for it. Cool, so should we go with the, the next top upvoted yes. question? So what are the differences between normal magnets and quantum magnets? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so let's actually think about what magnetism is. So um, if you get a loop of wire, and you pass a current around it, you'll, you'll obtain a magnetic moment. So the way to do it is you get your right hand. And if you have a, if you have a current going in the way of your fingers, you have a magnetic field in the way of your thumb. So fine. Does this mean that all, um, all magnetic materials have got tiny current loops in them? Well, it turns out if you take that approach, um, you can show that if you don't have quantum mechanics, it's impossible for materials that are non-rotating um, to have permanent magnetic dipoles. So 
according to classical physics, at least, bridge magnets are impossible. So the way out of this is you have spin. So spin and quantum mechanics saves the day. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and puts me in a job. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. And gives lots of scientists jobs in research. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's great. Spin is great. Spin um, is great. Now I did notice, yeah, there's there's a few questions kind of to spin. The one simply saying, what is spin? Can can we describe spin? Does that have a simple answer? Um what is spin? I mean, like, I have a quantum field theory book on my desk, but I don't <laughs> that. Um, what so, is spin? Hmm. It's just a um it's just a degree of freedom. Again, um yeah, it's the university. It's a it's like a second year undergrad thing you learn. Really. Mm. Oh, so spin. Yeah, spin is just an X oh okay. I have a good answer. I have an okay answer for this. So uh, again, if we go back to the whole idea of current loops, um, if you think about electrons going around the nuclei, um, they can have they they will have angular momentum mm. just by going round. Okay. Um so we can assign them orbital angular momentum. It turns out there's an extra um, contribution to the total magnetic, to, sorry, to the total orbital, I'm sorry. There's an extra contribution to the total uh, angular momentum of an atom. And it turns out that electrons just have an intrinsic angular momentum called spin. Um, and that's the simplest explanation I have of it. If you want to look into why, then you have to think about um, kind of special relativity and what symmetries that has and like how you can describe particles in that way. And spin pops out naturally. And that's, that's what Dirac managed to show. So Dirac gave a rather elegant mathematical explanation of why spin happens. Um, whereas it was known for um, a few years before then that, yeah, there's just an intrinsic angular momentum called spin. Right. So essentially without getting too deep into quantum field theory etc it's kind of just like a property a fundamental property that these these things have yeah mm -hmm. that then yeah. means they have lots of other fascinating uses and properties absolutely it has um contributions ranging from atomic physics um all the way to modern applications so for example you can if you think about <clears throat> if you think about modern like electronic devices, they can use electric currents, which is just net motion of, ele of electric charge. But what would happen if you, um, if you gave all of these up, if you made all the spins point in the same way for the electrons? Well, you'd then have a spin current. And so can that do interesting things? And that itself is a whole field of research um, and lends itself to, you know, all different kinds of novel electronic devices that you could make or rather spintronic devices that you could make so yeah the 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 applications are vast um, um fantastic yeah. that's amazing um right so i think just one more question unless there are any other burning ones um so the the next top up voter question so could other chargeless i think they meant chargeless as the correction underneath uh, oh yes could other chargeless particles for example neutrinos be used in the same way that neutrons are used um, yeah well <laughs> neutrinos um yeah neutrinos um i wouldn't want to use neutrinos uh because neutrinos don't interact with the strong force okay. um and they only interact with the weak interaction and and probably gravity, but we don't really understand that. Um, so yeah, the weak interaction is is as the name suggests, very, very weak. So you wouldn't be able to explore um, interesting nuclear properties that you could with neutrons. Um, it would just, yeah, it would be more expensive to generate them. It would, yeah, I wouldn't want to do it. Fair enough. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, it's a good question. Um, yeah. So it makes you consider it's not just the fact that they don't have charge, it's how they interact with the nuclei through the strong force as well. Yeah, it, it would be so difficult to do. I mean, doing neutrons is 
is already quite difficult. Mm. Um, yeah, and then you've got the practical. Yeah, my diagram is is right up here. It's it's already quite difficult to do. I wouldn't want to um, use neutron neutrinos. Sorry mm. to um, to determine kind of condensed matter properties. Um, yeah, also, also, we know way more about, about neutrons, um, just because they're easy to obtain. We've known about them for, for a lot longer. We've been able to measure a lot more of their properties. Um, you know, measuring the properties of neutrinos is, is a current yeah. um, endeavor in particle physics. Yeah, um, exactly. still properties that we actually can't explain. Yeah. Um, so there's, there's a rich field of physics in neutrinos already. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, great. So I think that's probably about all we'll have time for. So thank you very much, Miska, for answering those questions and for such a fascinating talk. Oh, uh, thank you for having me. Not at all. Our pleasure. And uh, thank you to all of those who stuck around for the extra questions. Mm -hmm.